Hello, everyone. I'm Joe Wellyu. Thanks so much for tuning in to Expert Insights, where we talk with industry leaders across modern financial services to discuss leadership and innovation. Let's get started. Hey, everyone. Excited to introduce today's guest, Mr. Clayton Collins. Clayton is the founder and CEO of HW Media, the parent company of real estate media and data brands, Housing Wire, Real Trends, Reverse Mortgage Daily, and Altos Research. Clayton formed HW Media in 2016 to acquire Housing Wire and has grown the company to be the premier information resource for mortgage and real estate professionals across the real estate economy, reaching over 500,000 professionals each month. Clayton also serves on the board of directors for SLM, a real estate agent onboarding and technology support business. He is also a member of, of the President's Young Leaders Council for Elon University and a member of Young President's organization. Uh, please welcome uh, Clayton Collins. Hey Clayton, uh, good to be with you, man. Uh, it's been a it's been a while. It's good to have you uh, have you on the show. And uh, how's life, Joe? It's wonderful to see you. Life is good. Um, I have uh, you know been busy working through this evolution of the housing industry that we're gonna we're gonna talk about today. Just got back from a, a trip to Portland where I had the chance to spend some time with some some awesome real estate brokers and get some perspective from from that side of the market and uh gearing up to go to MBA tech right now. So um you know I'm I am excited to be face to face with so many lending and real estate brokerage leaders uh as we we kick off um, what we hope to be a spring home buying and selling season that, um, you know, treats all the mortgage and real estate world well. Yeah, no question. You, you have such a unique perspective because you, you guys are immersed so much in not just the real estate community, but the lending community and then the technology community and how all of those things weave together. And, uh, before we got on air, we, we talked a little bit about all of the, the changes that are going on out there and how companies and brands, practitioners are adjusting. And I want to talk about the evolution of the industry because that's really the best way to describe what's taken place. So let's maybe start there and give me your high level thoughts. Yeah. So, Joe, I think when people talk about what's happening in, in housing right now, it, it's really easy to focus on some of, some of the negative things like the, the, the negative or the, the increase in interest rates, which has resulted in um, a drop off in refi and drop off in purchase and, and lack of inventory. But what's ultimately going on here, um, kind of behind a, a, a confluence of, of challenging dynamics, is an evolutionary process where the housing industry has an opportunity and honestly, a responsibility to make itself better and build more efficient operations. And, you know, I don't, you know, exactly know th what the impact of this will be, but we're, we're seeing such a flight to quality. We're, and I, when I talk about flight to quality, I don't just mean a flight to the most efficient lenders. I, I mean a flight to the, mo the best loan originators. We're seeing volume start to consolidate to the top players. Mediocrity, this is your, this is your phrase, man, but like mediocrity is not being rewarded. It gets punished. Mediocrity gets punished, man. Mediocrity gets punished. And the same thing's happening in, in real estate brokerage. We are we just dropped our Real Trends rankings of the top agents, teams, and brokerages in the country. And, and guess what? The, uh, the volume continues to consolidate and concentrate with the top performers. And uh, I don't know... You know, that's a that's a tough thing if you're a mediocre agent or loan originator or a part timer on the on the real estate side. But it's a good thing if you're a consumer, because when volume starts to concentrate, the best get better. And um, I saw a great line a few weeks ago is nobody needs advice from a part timer. And that's something homeowners should take into account as they're thinking about who they work with from a loan origination or real estate sales perspective. That's such a great statement. And if you think about how many people that were really in, for lack of a better way to phrase it, dabbling in the industry, 
right? They, they were looking to make easy money. Uh, and what you're describing to me is ultimately uh, the, those people are not going to be relevant anymore. And we're seeing it show up in the data. Drill into that a little bit for me. And from your seat, which, which I think you have such a depth in perspective, what is the difference between these people where the volume is consolidating on you know, across the industry in, in both sectors or in both segments and from the real estate side and the lending side? What do you see? Ultimately, it's, it's, a, it's been a good thing that the real estate industry and the loan origination industry have a relatively low bar to enter. It means that people from a diverse array of backgrounds can enter the housing industry in, in some capacity. They don't have to go to college. They don't have to go to an Ivy League school. They don't have to go to through some long training program or medical residency or graduate degree program. You can come from different walks of life in different backgrounds. And one of the reasons that is really important is because the American homeowner comes from many walks of life and many different diverse backgrounds. So when you create high bars to enter a profession, you end up with a with a much more homogenous um, category of worker. So the housing industry, by not having this extremely high bar, allows people from all walks of life to enter. Now, the challenge is, do you stay once, once you're in the industry? And if you stay, it doesn't necessarily depend on the fact of like where your education is from. It depends on like what you give it and like, do you, do you dabble or do you commit? So we're going through this cycle right now. National Association of Realtors is projecting a pretty big drop off in membership from 2022 to 2023. We're seeing projections that loan orig- originator headcount is going to go down um, to a degree in, in 2023. Um, and is that necessarily a bad thing? No, it, it's pushing out the dabblers. It's rewarding the people who've committed to building careers as housing professionals. And those are the people who can provide the best advice to homeowners. Those are the people that work well with their counterparts. It still blows my mind how many realtors don't think highly of loan originators and vice versa. It's because it, they're, they're so true, right? Their I vision mean, is anchored in a dabbler or a part-timer. Yeah. Like you're like working with a realtor who's like working 10 hours a week is not going to be a good experience for an LO and working for a realtor who's working with an LO who's built his or her whole pipeline on refi or like isn't isn't like a fully committed professional. That's going to be a bad experience too. So as we go through this kind of like cleansing period and really reward the people who are committed to building careers in the housing industry, we're going to create better working relationships across the industry. We're going to reward the originators who are doing the volume to have the resources to invest in technology. And the people that are left in the industry on the other side will be closer to their highest and best use. And I think their highest and best use, if you're a tip of the spear person in the housing industry, um, working with consumers, is working with consumers and building relationships and giving advice, not input, not inputting data a dozen times, not like re- repeating processes or spending all your time on paperwork. It is working with consumers and giving advice. And uh, the technology should, from our perspective, of course, should enable them to do more of that, right? And it sounds like you believe the same thing. Oh, 100%. Like, I mean, like this is, I've never believed the, the rhetoric that technology is going to replace the loan originator, replace the real estate agent. Um, it's going to help them for like be their highest and best and be like better advisors and, and sellers on behalf of their clients. Now, I think technology can replace some of the checker checking checkers jobs in the in the operations side of the housing industry. And you know, that's you know, that's that's tough to see. Like we hate to see the reduction in forces and the headcount reductions that that we've seen recently. But ultimately, um, that might help those people get to their highest and best use too, and uh, you know, figure out um, where their their intellect and skills can really be rewarded. And the environment that we have recently, the environment where we came from in 2020, 2021 was so exuberant that it wasn't a necessity to have those efficiencies, to have those businesses optimized. And it it feels like a lot, like we're just being, organizations are being forced that direction right now. And the ones that are making the choices to optimize workflow, optimize for 
performance, uh, they're being rewarded. You agree? So I had a really senior mortgage bank CEO on my housing news podcast back in like, I think it was a Q2. So about a, about a year ago, uh, Q2 2022. And um, this is an organization where like some other industry participants have criticized for, for being really refi heavy in a, in a time period when the industry was shifting to entire focus on, on purchase. And um, one of the comments really stuck with me that, that was shared is that if we hadn't pivoted to refi and other lenders hadn't pivoted to refi, millions of American homeowners would be sitting in mortgages at rates significantly above market. And because of the mortgage industry's ability to quickly pivot to serve consumers to refinance their their loans at at 2.75 three three and a half percent the american consumer and the american economy was served well and i and i think there's some some power in that statement but to fulfill that statement it required throwing human capital into the ecosystem to the quick pivot to ramp up technology to handle refi volume when that opportunity presented itself would have left money on the table for the mortgage originators and would have left consumers on the sidelines that weren't able to be served because it takes time to improve processes and implement technology. Now, Joe, the question is, now the last six months of lender as lenders have had more time, have they invested in technology and have they helped start to build more elastic and efficient lending ecosystems that can scale as volume ebbs and flow and as interest rates move. So I want to talk a little bit about the elastic, sustainable business models that we believe are or ha you have to get to right now, right? And are you seeing uh, the organizations making the investments from the conversations you're having? Kind of going back to the same talking points we see with loan originators and real estate agents, there's a bifurcation. And um, the bifurcation is sits with the resources in the organization. Did lenders preserve cash on their balance sheet in 2022? Um, did they access the public markets, which gives them, you know, some public market pressure, but also access to relatively access to capital, let's leave it there, access to capital to invest in their business? Um, or did they distribute all their cash or pay ridiculous sign-on bonuses at the wrong time? Um, like there's a bifurcation in resources and the lenders on the right side of bifurcation who came in to the second half of 2022 with cash in the balance sheet um, and weren't afraid. I mean, now this, is, this is the callous side, but like I think the lenders who weren't afraid to act quickly and right size their workforces are in a significantly better position today. And those are the lenders that, even though they right size certain roles, improved their resources and their ability to invest in technology. So, so Joe, I see a clear bifurcation. There are still lenders that are sitting on the sidelines, unable to invest because they don't have the cash and their cost structure is not in the right place. And those are the lenders who are losing market share right now and are likely going to be consolidated in, in some form or fashion, or they just keep their head in the sand and like keep costs low until the market returns. But that will be a time when their competition is so far ahead because they've so been investing in ahead. technology for two years while like the guys who didn't have cash, didn't have the balance sheet, didn't have the access to credit, um, sat on the sidelines. Um, so bifurcation. So it's almost like a slow death for the half or the quarter or whatever the industry that didn't take action quickly, right size of the business didn't or is not making the investments for whatever reason, uh, whether they hang on for a bit or not. I think your statement on the people that have as the industry volumes come back to more normal levels, they're, they're going to just be so far ahead with data and technology that they're just going to continue to to take market share. I mean, that's been my observation. You're, you, you, you're selling enterprise technology. So, so what do you see? Yeah. I mean, are you seeing? I, I see the same thing. Yeah, I see the same thing. I was, I've been on site a with a lot of customers and it's, there's really two camps, right? You have the camp where uh, they are, I would say in some cases kind of paralyzed by fear or they're paralyzed by inability to take action because of ownership structure or executive teams. 
Uh, the companies that cut early in the cycle, right size their cost structure as much as they could early in the cycle, that have gotten to within striking distance of profitability, uh, those organizations right now, we're, we're just seeing great momentum in those organizations and in, in their ability to be strategic and identifying deal flow, identifying new referral opportunities, identifying ways to optimize their middle performers and get them up sort of all of the above. It just seems to be the ones that were taking action early are now you're just seeing them starting to make progress in a lot of ways. Isn't that such a phenomenal like entrepreneurial like or operator yeah. case study in that it is you know you go back to summer 2022 and like you see some of the headlines and of reduction in forces and like those organizations and those leaders at the time kind of looked a little bit weak looked like they had made a strategic misstep looked like well, they yeah well remember and everybody was like a lot of those people they they were like wait a second you guys made so much money and and now you're laying people off yeah that's not fun to do but you got to hand it to them at this point it looks like they were really thinking long term and they're like wait if i don't do this the health of my company my ability to serve consumers is going to be in jeopardy yeah it's such a tough topic to talk about, Joe, because I know when you publish this episode and, and I know when I publish our housing news episodes, there's someone listening that's been on the negative, been, been impacted by a reduction in force. And I think it's really important to to talk about this topic with with like humility and knowing that like there are people at all levels from the most junior to very senior roles that, that have been negatively impacted here. And, um, and you know, you and I sit here from a, a really fortunate position both leading our organizations and um still still employed and still propelling in the right direction and i know there's people who aren't like you know aren't as fortunate as where you and i sit right now but there's the whole lens of looking at this through like the 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 entrepreneur and like business operator perspective and exactly like you just said those those leaders who acted swiftly and made smart decisions for their organizations last summer are in a better position today and um and ultimately that creates a better company for the people that are still part of it and those companies will hire again they, they will grow again hopefully they do it more efficiently and more focused um, and in the right roles and, and people that can implement uh technology and build more efficient sustainable ecosystems but um it's just two different, two very different lenses, but it's like neither is wrong, but like they're, it's just two things you have to think about. No question. I, you make a great point though. I mean, these environments, as you see layoffs, I mean, it's, it's never lost on, on any of us that lead organizations that when those things happen, like you're really impacting people's lives and it's the last thing anybody wants to do for the most part, right? I, I, the leaders that I talk to that have been through those significant things. Like you can tell it's heavy. They wear they wear that on their shoulders in a lot of cases, right? And so, um, but at the end of the day, it's it's about the long term. And uh, and I think that's, you know, we've clearly identified some of what we're seeing out there. Joe, I think it like another thing that's really worth paying attention to is another another it's not just capital and cash that is um differentiating players in the industry it's also it's also mindset and uh well, it's going, I, yeah I, I think that the players with the right mindset all the way from from the c-suite to the originator to the broker like across the organization that like facing tough markets with the right uh mindset that there's market share to be had and this is when com companies differentiate themselves and this is when professionals differentiate themselves is, is so Im important and um running a news org like it's like it's like we, we cover like the good and the bad there's been some bad headlines you, you do by the way sometimes i'm like clayton like that's like you might get some nasty grams from that post or or that uh, piece that you did but you cover you cover all of it so I, yeah, I mean, you can't, I, you know, you can't you pick and choose, how much, right? You know how much worse this industry would be if everyone stuck their head in the sand and didn't acknowledge totally. like some of the negative economic news or, or challenging industry news. Like, I mean, I like, yeah, you get the nasty grams, but I like strongly believe that 
we're playing a role in moving the housing market forward. Our mission is moving markets forward um, and arming people with information to make better decisions. So like, you know, yeah, I do like to think that last summer when we were pointing at some of the inventory challenges and the rate challenges, we were cited in a board deck when people are talking about their strategy for the next six months. And we helped our audience make better decisions. But I really like that's not really the vein I was going down. Like the vein that I was focused on is how to how do you take information and use it to um to motivate your team and keep people in the right mindset, like and and actually talk about the challenging market so people don't just fall in like the USA Today headlines and uh think the world is crashing and don't have the right. context that we do as market professionals. Con context. Okay. That let, let's talk about that. And I think context in my opinion if you can get context that will help inform your mindset and um, we both agree strongly and we see this in addition to the other trends we talk about the difference between the half or the top quarter that's really winning right now is they've got that growth mindset they're driving that into their organizations and they're saying i know things are on fire they're burning but there's opportunity and there's really big opportunity on the back side of this but Talk to me about, you guys put out so much education-centric content, for lack of a better word, that provides context. How important do you believe it is that that context layer is for professionals and companies to translate that down to the consumer? Yeah, I mean, so our strategy is to provide information and news and data and research for the housing professional. Now, we don't write it through the lens of like, hey, copy and paste this screenshot it, share it with the consumer. Um, some of our folks do that and, we, and we, we love and appreciate it, but we want to give the professional context so they can flip it into the story that their consumer needs to hear. Um, I just got back from the, the thousand watt turn on conference in, in Portland and um, the thousand watt team's really creative and they, they prepared a video that um, was from the vantage point of a consumer. Like, and like the video said, I am not a lead. I am not a contact. I don't know what HMDA is. Like, don't talk to me about amortization. Uh, I'm a human. I'm a human. I have, I'm unique. I have a financial world that's unique to me, right? And the, I'm guessing that that the is most part important of the story. person is me. I'm buying a house. I'm going to live in it. And like the con, like, and uh, there's another speaker who talked about, um, less facts, more feel and talking about how content makes people feel. So like I'd see our vantage point as like housing wire, real trends, like we're going to give you the facts. Now it's your job to turn that into a message that helps your consumer feel and feel about what the decisions they're, they're going to make in their, in their, their housing journey. So they need, to human, to they need to humanize they need to humanize it yeah and i know like one of your recent get guests on this this show talked a lot about education and how he as a top originator in the country leverages information and knowledge to educate not only his originators and team but like the real estate agents and uh and consumers that that do business with them and um i i, I know this this gentleman well and like he's a master at like bringing feeling and context to to the information so um, master and the gentleman we're talking about sean benozian who's on a, a recent episode and uh he he's world class at that and his his phrase on the show was uh, education attracts right and and we were talking about marketing and growing the business and and he really made it clear and i'm like there's a reason, obviously, he's the best in the country, and you can clearly see that. But it, it just resonates, and I think there's a lot of people. A lot of people can learn from those types of statements and how they approach the industry. Yeah, and there's a you know, in bringing it back to the the beginning where we kind of talk about a consolidation of market share to the the full timers, not the people who dabble. Like Sean lives this industry; he is a housing professional. Um, so it's a big part of his identity. And, uh, and I see that across top performers across this industry. I consider myself a housing professional. I, there is no like personal Clayton and housing Clayton. Like I am like this, this is me. And, uh, and I, I think there's a lot of people 
in this industry who've dedicated themselves to, to housing, to selling houses, to financing houses, to participating in, in, in some way. And I think that those people embrace that message that Sean shared that education attracts. And you have to know this industry inside and out to understand how like each economic move is going to impact your clients and how it's going to make your clients feel. We've recently seen so many headlines. Like, like I heard someone joke recently, like I miss the days when the fed chair's name wasn't on the tip of my tongue. Like 90% of the country should not know who Jerome Powell is, but right, right. now a lot of people do. <laughs> he's like one of the most famous people in the country, right? Yeah. Now. Like he's got memes. He's got like, he's J pal to a lot of people like that should yeah. not exist. Like we should not know who the, Fed chair is like maybe, maybe yeah. you and I, Joe, but like That's 99 percent of the country should not know who Jerome Powell is. That, and that uh, is a good and we definitely point. shouldn't tell our consumers about J Powell. We shouldn't be telling consumers about a 25 percent rate increase because it does not mean a 25 percent mortgage rate increase, which we all know. Everyone that listens to this show understands the difference between the Fed funds rate and mortgage rates. But um, but, but the uh, average consumer doesn't. I mean, I know have to. In, in our company when they when you see a twenty five basis point increase from the Fed, they automatically assume that uh, their mortgage rates are are going to go up, right? And so, you know, I think to your to your points earlier, Manny, you really have to get the context and and connect at a human level with people to help them understand. I mean, I saw a real estate agent post on Instagram yesterday that her consumers should have locked over the weekend because rates just went up 25%. And I'm like, Ooh, like, okay, not my job to correct you, but, um, like you just, you, you dabble or just mess somebody up. Give me your perspective on the amount of consolidation that you're seeing in the originator side and the real estate side. Uh, if you have data, you're willing to share or a, or a thesis. Yeah. So I mean, we published an article from with a source from a couple of investment banks that IMB consolidation could range like 30 to 40% in 2023. But I, I think that thesis, um, this was a couple months ago, I think that thesis was a little bit flawed in the, the assumption that consolidation would be the result of mergers and acquisitions. And uh, it, it, as fast as this market changed, the definition of consolidation and real estate brokerage and mortgage origination has, has changed. Um, there's a term that's being used really regularly in real estate right now. Um, they're called walkover acquisitions, where uh, you're consolidating to local independents or an independent in a franchise. And um, no one's getting paid. You're just getting a, a new home. And, um, and like, it's, uh, you know, it's in, in the tech world, we call it a, an accu hire or, or, or a rescue. Um, but, uh, that that's happening in real estate and that seems to be the trend that's happening in mortgage. Um, I recently got a behind the scenes look at a, um, at a, uh, at a IMB acquisition and, um, you know, headline might look okay. Reality is all of the comp is deferred and contingent. And uh, the the retention agreements and agreements that LOs have to sign to come over are hairy. They're not pretty. Um, so some of the M and A that gets announced isn't really what it what it looks like. Yeah, the the packaging around it doesn't tell the full story in many cases. Yep. So um, I think there you know there might be a few good more a few more good deals to be had, uh, but there are there will be a lot of consolidation that as a result of failed shops and um kind of aqua hiring over the origin origination of ta talent and bringing that volume into a lender who prepared their balance sheet in 2022 to muscle through the hard times um and then then there's the the consolidation through recruitment and um there are some fierce recruiters out there who are pinning down their competitors um th through recruiting efforts and uh I think a lot of the consolidation will be the result of the strongest players out competing their competition. The one thing I would mention that I see, and I'm curious as to your feedback, we, we do see people hyper aggressive on recruiting and some of them are successful at retaining those folks, but it's like there was a gap that got really masterful at the recruiting process and not really masterful at onboarding wrapping their arms around those people, making them successful once they moved over. And we're seeing 
really a bifurcation there in some cases, and you're starting to see some of those people go back the other direction. Do you hear things about that? Yeah. And, and uh, you know, a lot of it comes back to the theme of technology. So some of the consolidated companies are com- are lenders who had not invested in technology and they're coming into organizations that had, and you have originators who aren't tech native or tech centric, um, suddenly being asked to change their processes and use new tools they've never used before. And the learning curve is steep. So like you look at this as a, a top performing origination shop, and you're like, wait, this this guy doesn't know how to use our, our LOS or this gal won't use our point of sale or she's still using like her own like CRM and like, come on, come into the, uh, come on, come into the fold. We know how to do this. And, um, I think in a market where there's so much pressure on volume and, uh, the divide between someone who's a cost center and a profit center is, is pretty, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty thin divide. Um, you know, make some of those recruiting conversations challenging, but I, I am one thing kind of reassuring, thing I have seen in recruiting is I think some recruiters and origination shops are getting better at knowing who they are and and who they work for. Um, There's a few shops I've seen out there who said, hey, we are the home for like kind of the later career originator who wants to like dabble and push a few loans through that, once a month. That's like, okay. At least they're being honest, right? That's, and they're that's, being what, we, clear. that's what we do. We're, we're, we're good at that. Like come hang your, come hang your license with us. And um there's other shops who have more aggressive sales cultures and mediocrity will be punished. And, uh, as long as you know that going in, I, I I think that's a good thing. Like there, there needs to be a home for originators who have different aspirations and different goals and different styles. But, uh, it, the scary part is when people aren't honest with themselves about their organization or their own skill set and join a company that has entirely an entirely different culture than they've spent their career building. That's such a great point. And we see that all the time. The people, A, they're not honest with themselves on their ability to change and evolve. And we talked at the beginning of the episode, this is an environment of really rapid change and evolution. And they're not being honest with themselves on like, hey, am I willing to do the work to become a type of professional that I've never been before? And then ultimately, uh, there's a lot of scenarios where they don't maybe examine the company they're at and say, do they match do what is what they're doing, the investments they're making, does that match what I want to do with my career, right? Does it line up? Well, Clayton, I really appreciate your your perspective and the unique position you have in the industry. Thanks so much for the time today. Joe, thank thank you so much. I, I love the direction the conversation went and and talking about how education attracts. It's a it's a big part of our our mission here and always encourage loan originators to check out our our lending life newsletter. You can find it easily on the on Housing Wire, um, which we curate specifically for loan originators. And with Joe, we hope you and the total expert team and everyone who listens will join us at Housing Wire Annual in, in October. We're doing a a lot of effort to bring together the mortgage and real estate ecosystem under one roof. Um, It's a big part of why I founded HW Media is to look at the housing sector in totality and help build relationships across this this really important sector. Um, So Housing Wire Annual in October. Housing Wire Annual in October. And I want to say just one more uh, one more item. Let me back up for a minute. I want to I want to make one more point on the fact that you guys are bringing lenders and real estate practitioners together in the same environment. Don't you think there's just tremendous unrealized opportunity for lenders and the real estate side to work better together to serve the end customer? Oh, a- absolutely. And uh, I think as we keep coming back to that theme of consolidating the volume around the top performers, that will become more and more obvious. Uh, it's really shocked me how how much how differently real estate and mortgage professionals think and they they run it they run at different paces and they kind of see themselves as part of different communities and different ecosystems. And uh, you know, I have the thesis that I'm making big bets on that these two sectors are going to realize how much they mean to each other and how much the relationships can be improved by by coming together under one roof, even if that's just once a year. Um, but we but we want to be a um, a factor for change in in that arena. I think that's fantastic. And ultimately, the best part about it is the end consumer generally is going to have a better outcome if those if those two sides of the transaction are, are in sync. So 100%. Thanks so much, Clayton. We'll see you soon. Thanks so much for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. 